gained a little bit of understanding of how I approach my relationship to wild plants, um, how to harvest sustainably. That's something that's important to me as a long time um, you know, an environmentalist and somebody that works with plants, local food advocate. Um, but you'll also go away learning a couple of new weeds that might um, you know, be dastardly weed garden, you know, weed, you know, friends that might pop up into your garden. Hopefully I inspire people to look at the different weeds outside your door a little differently. Um, and also just maybe see in fields, not just fields of green, but fields of different colors. Because to me, um, when I look into a wild field or if I'm out on my trails, um, the plants that are in those fields and along those trails, they're just as beautiful to me as my cultivated gardens. Um, so hopefully, you know, the, the definition of weeds is kind of, you know, my, my English heritage in me really wants to get people to remember that weeds are really just wildflowers in a different place. So um, if you do have specific questions, think about them. I do encourage, I love participation. For me, um, I'm a hands-on learner. I think that um, as a gardener, long-time gardener, as a cook, I learn by doing. So people will call and say, how do I start foraging or how do I start learning plants? And my answer really is you have to get outside. There's no um, armchair foraging. I know a lot of academics write about wild plants and write about wild edibles, but it's really important to get outside to get like, um, if you're a gardener, you have seasons, for the garden plants, wild foods, wild plants can have similar seasons. There's a time for the nuts, there's a time for the berries, there are times for different wild edible greens. Um, and getting outside will help acclimate you to the weather and to the shifts. Um, one summer rain in June can quickly wipe out your wild roses that you might want to gather for balms or salves or to dry for tea or the elderflowers in July. One of those big summer rainstorms can just completely trash the flowers. So getting outside is, um, you know, something that, that is, is really, really, really key to learning about wild foods. Um, how many people consider themselves foragers? Closet foragers. <laughs> How many people love to pick mulberries off the trees that line the streets of our city? Okay, you're foragers. <laughs> 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 How many eat the purslane in their gardens? How many know the purslane? It's, don't throw your purslane out. How many people know that purslane in Green City Markets in New York City now goes for $7.99 a pound? Right? Insane. Uh, a little bit about me. My background, um, grew up in West Michigan. My family's originally from the other side of the state. But I grew up just a few minutes from the Big Lake. Uh, Hoffmaster State Park was my childhood playground. Um, you know, the beach hugely influenced my childhood and my um, growing up as a sailor on the lake. My mother was a gardener. Between those influences on my life, have always connected me to plants. Um, people say to me, how long have you been working with wild plants? And, um, you know, this isn't my first book, but when I got this book in hand and from my publisher and I flipped through it, I looked, you know, I did most of the photography and I wrote about what I knew and um, and really what spoke to me, the plants I love, the nuances of the plants, the things that I wanted to share. And I looked through and I'm like, whoa, this kind of took me my whole life to know this stuff. It's like, I can't really say at one point that I ever deemed myself a forager. I mean, my mother had Concord grapes, wild grapes, not Concords, but just those wild, rambling little grapes along the back hedgerow. And we put up quarts of wild grape juice every year. And um, I do know the exact amount of grape juice my body can tolerate to the negative equation factor. I mean, it's one of those childhood staples that we would just devour. Um, you know, we would have, there were, there were wild apples just around the corner. 
my mother would go, I'm not a mushroom. I have my favorite mushrooms. There's a woman in town, her name is Nicole Mathias. She is a mushroom magician. Like, mushrooms appear for her. Like, I think I have a lot of magic with plants, but she can, she's the mushroom queen. But my mother loved morels um, and continues to love anytime, you know, she doesn't go out, she's not physically able to go through the woods like she used to be. But loves morels and those springtime morels with the springtime asparagus, you know, those memories for me are part of my life. And when people say or come to me, you know, I, I don't, you know, it's, I don't really ever know what draws someone one to my work. But usually at the end, somebody will come and tell me a story about their childhood or about just some recipe that's been meaningful to them that like a memory's been triggered. And professionally, my work has been in local food systems. My background is um, classically trained as an anthropologist, studying agriculture um, around the world. The food, land, and people connection to me has always been something of interest. How food as economy, food as social, societal um, relationships, cultural um, meaning, you know, food for everybody. We have such heritage around what we eat. Um, wild plants, when you start to eat wild foods, you can start to, this sounds, this sounds goofy, groovy, and hippie, but it starts to really, it can connect us to our heritage. It can connect us to where we're from. And even if we're transplants to this place, who's like a little <coughs> Michigander, like born and bred? So even if we grew up here, most of us are not indigenous to here. We're from somewhere else. Um, you know, that's the, the histories of where our peoples have been, we all bring that along, like through the human DNA, is like this collective gathering of ideas and, and memories as to where we're from. So when you start to eat wild food, you know, the, the really bitter chicory greens, or the dandelion greens, or the nettles, like our bodies start to remember what real food is. Um, you know, as just one that studied industrialized agriculture, good for good, bad, the good, bad, and the ugly, um, you know, our bodies, we really only have two flavors in the, the current um, standard American diet, what are they? Sweet and salty. Now, I'm going to qualify this by saying I never met a bag of kettle chips I didn't like. <laughs> okay? And I love glazed donuts. <laughs> now, you know, the sweet and salty flavor palette in, in the natural world, salty are nettles. Salty is seaweed, wild seaweeds. There's nothing more awesome than tasting, if I'm not from the ocean, I'm from like the Sweetwater Lakes. But I have a friend out in the um, West Coast who hand harvests her seaweeds in Oregon, bull kelp. And there's nothing more amazing than to snack on that bull kelp. Actually have a jar of it on my counter. When I want to reach for the kettle chips, I won't kettle chips. <laughs> that bull kelp can be a wonderful nutrient-dense alternative, and it's a naturally salty flavor. But salty in the natural world, like that's the extreme salty. The nettles are salty. Those wild foods have different nuances that we don't, um, we've lost acclimation to with the industrialized food systems. Sweet, sweet foods aren't glazed donuts in the natural world. There are the berries and the apples. What other flavors do we have in the wild world? We have astringent and tart and bitter flavors. How many times do we actually put bitter foods on our plates? The dandelion greens sometimes might make their way. But the most cultivated uh, bitter greens we have in our diets really are relegated to maybe romaine lettuce, maybe arugula. I love arugula. Um, but endives, the endives and the chicories. Uh, in Europe, the endives and the chicories are a common food staple, but in the United States, we don't have those as part of our diet, and they're a really necessary flavor, that bitter flavor to have as part of our meal. Why? Why do we need bitter flavors? Digestion. Digestion! 
Um, we need those flavors, you know, in addition to the antioxidants, in addition to um, the carotenoids and all the different things that get converted into vitamins inside our bodies. Um, that bitter flavor that we need to actually taste, um, <coughs> you know, to the, the first, the first, the tongue is this complex palette of flavor receptors to communicate to the brain to help us um, with digestion. And that's, that bitter flavor tells our body we're going to, you know, to stimulate digestion with the bile production of the gallbladder and of the liver. Um, incorporating those foods, you know, whether you're going out and foraging dandelion greens or choosing to add cultivated endives from the farmer's market, we all need to eat those, um, those greens for, for our tummies. And, um, you know, part of the, the lack of the bitter flavor in our diet can be directly correlated to the increase of irritable bowel disease. It can be directly, you know, we eat a lot of sweet and salty foods. Those bitter herbs, we'll talk about, I brought a basket um, of herbs and weeds and um, foods just from the hedgerows of my own home, of all the wild, and I think I brought animals and bugs with me too. <laughs> As I'm being circled by other oh, flies, maybe they're maybe they're running the flies. <laughs> um, all these different wild flavors that you can start to incorporate. So, you know, I don't expect in any of my lectures, I, I never expect everybody to go home and till up their front yard, which I'm prone to do, and plant vegetable gardens. Though, so if you do it, you will get two thumbs up from me. Um, or to start like eating everything off trees um, because I do want to talk as I am non-linear I like to tell stories I want to infuse um, sensical ways to approach wild foods of course one of them being don't eat anything that you don't know what it is that sounds like a really crazy thing but um, I'm known to snack and taste and, and I try not to push the envelope if I really don't know what it is you know properly ID things if you're cooking for other people, please, 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 please do your due diligence to properly ID. We laugh and think that's funny. As um, botanists, even as backyard botanists, one of you know people will say frequently, "How do I get started? How do I get familiar with learning plants?" Um, one of your pieces of homework today is to start where you live. And where you live, you can be, you know, you can have a rental property, you can be a couch surfer, you can own your home, but wherever you're at in this place, start by stepping off your patio step. Take note, this is how I really recommend people to become foragers, or not even foragers, just attuned to the wild plant life around you. Step off into your patio, into your, you know, onto the, the street side. Take notice of where the trees are. Don't worry so much so about putting names to trees just yet. But just the art of observation is your best tool as a forager. The tasting and the smelling and the other senses are additionally important. But as you start to ID, observation is first and foremost helpful. Take note of the trees, you know, take note of this type of soil. Is it rocky? Do you not have soil? Is it concrete? Do you have plants growing up between the cracks in the sidewalk? Do you have evergreen conifer trees that are covered in pine needles with just some scrub brush? Is it a vacant lot full of, you know, weedy clovers and dock? Um, take note not just of the vegetation, but also your built environment, okay? This is something that as a gardener, if you're planting a garden bed, how many gardeners do I have? Lots of gardeners. If you plant a garden where you put your garden and the soil, you usually do a soil test. It's prudent, so you can best ensure your vegetables are going to grow. But you also would think about this, the direction of the sun. Knowing a couple of things about your soil is going to dictate what grows there. So of course, as you become a more advanced naturalist or environmentalist, you start to learn ecosystems and what plants live with what. Nature is super cool and can organize plants. Like there's a, there's a rhyme and reason for how nature is categorized. Um, but taking time to notice, you'll start to see, oh, this grows with this. The plantain 
grows at every trailhead, or the plantain grows where my dog pees. You might not want to harvest that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll start to see. You'll also start, um, as you start to notice not just what's in the landscape, but the built environment. Are you in a city? Are you um, next door to some factories? Do you have a creek that goes through your, your property? What are you downstream from? Are you on the Grand River? Everything along the Grand River environmentally in the city of Grand Rapids is pretty much deemed a brownfield zone. And for those of you that don't know, brownfield is basically a, you know, an EPA designation that says there's a lot of stuff in the soil. <laughs> okay. Knowing the history of the land that you live on will tell you what kinds of soil contaminants will be in your soil. It will tell you, so maybe you don't live in a city, maybe you live more in the Caledonia area, and I've, you know, out where Natalie from the library down there is at, um, maybe you live, you know, in a former orchard land. Ag practices, you know, past agricultural practices, they leave their own footprint. Arsenic has been used in past for orchards um, in the cities they're led. So, in addition to knowing, while you may not, as a, as a gardener, you'll soil test, right? But as a forager, you know, we don't have big fans of fancy equipment. I would love if I could be bestowed upon with this big fancy laboratory on wheels that could do these core samples and, you know, really get to understand the, the composition of different plants in different places. That would be super cool for me someday. But I, you know, I'm just a ditch we gatherer. <laughs> no fancy equipment. I have to use these common sense baseline indicators for me of do I harvest here, do I not harvest here, should I choose another place, okay? You might not be able to get the full history of the soil that you live on, but you can <coughs> kind of do a surface evaluation and say, hmm, there's a railroad track right there. Railroad tracks you know, classic place to have leached arsenic. Hmm. Any plant that takes up a mineral that we would eat for nutrition, okay, common plants would be spinach, wild plants would be nettle, dock, um, you know, the chicories, anything we would eat for the nutrition, for the iron, for the magnesium, for the calcium, those plants can take up lead and arsenic. So, like, this is like foraging very super fast. You know, <laughs> things to think about. I hope you're taking notes. To know your land is one part of it, and to know your plants as you start to identify these plants in your neighborhood, to know how, what is the, you know, what is the, the value of them? What is what is their nutritional component? Why are they there? Now, I will say, um, I go on plant walks and I take people into the woods a lot and into the fields and we're so curious and we all of a sudden want to turn the wild fields into our supermarket that we're all, the, the first question usually is, what is this good for? What is this good for? What is that good for? And you just, because you want to know. I always laugh and I think part philosophy um, of appreciating the natural world is not always um, looking at, at a plant to get to know its edibility or use. It's kind of like going to a cocktail party and getting to know people and saying like, who's that Wendy girl? I wonder, I wonder, what are you good for, Wendy? What are you good for? I wonder what she's good for. I wonder what, you know, I wonder what you're good for, Asher or Ritsu. What are you guys good for? And like it develops this exchange. What I love about like taking people into the natural world is getting them excited about meeting plants. And like, this is kind of to have them, and it's kind of a mystery. Some of them you can eat, some of them you can't eat. Some plants, you know, when you talk about invasive species with naturalists, with dastardly invasive species, some of them are doing natural remediation work for us, even though they're not edible. Some of them are holding down, I mean, this is like a lot of philosophy that we can get into, you know, as our practices unfold. Um, but plants have, the earth is, Something I was given from my father, he would say, he was an engineer, brilliant man, um, he would say, you know, the earth systems are really perfect. And humans, we try to engineer 
systems that are never nearly as perfect as the natural world. And you know, we try to do these things to mimic the natural systems. We try to, you know, we'll try to remediate the soil or um, control a certain pest by introducing another pest that gives us maybe a hundred other unintended consequences, right? So I really encourage you to explore that space outside your door, um, just to kind of hold that and start to learn, you know, what could be edible, but what other purpose might it have? Um, you know, as you learn the, the, the use of the land and the plants, matching it up to ID is definitely one of your next most important things. Having you know, my plant guide is not comprehensive. If you get into this work, how many currently have tables of plant guides at their home? It's like a, it's like a gateway book hoarding issue, I think. You know, you start to get one, and you're like, oh, well, that doesn't answer my question. I'm going to get this one. And you can't go to the library. Why well, I love my libraries and want to push libraries, you're not going to give these books back in time. You're going to want to keep them all to yourself. <laughs> So you're going to incur all this, like, these library fines because you just don't want to give them back because you might need it to have it on hand, right? And then all of a sudden, plant books have taken over your life, um, as well as canning jars, drying racks, and, I mean, who else has this problem? I probably am a plant hoarder. Okay. I call it an apothecary. <laughs> it's a much fancier word. So... Um, you know, as you explore as this backyard botanist, the internet will be helpful. There are lots of online groups um, available through Facebook, through um, you know, lots of good online resources. The Missouri Botanic Garden, huge compendium of information. The University of Michigan has a huge herbarium website online that can actually tell us by county level the different plants distributed across the area. Um, so not only for safety reasons do you want to safely ID species, what other reasons would you want to know your plant species and the plant's distribution? I'm not sure, but I think what you were, maybe what you were getting at earlier was that plants, certain plants can be indicators of what the soil profile looks like. Okay, good. That's a good answer. Good. What other reasons? Endangered. Good. You want to know the distribution. Um, you'll start to see patterns. Absolutely. You know, Katie had said, it, you know, plants that grow are, in, are indicators. Red clover, dock, um, those are really common wild weeds in urban lots. Those plants frequently help remediate soil. They're healthful for us. They're great nutrient-dense foods but they can remediate soil and take up lead. Some of them are nitrogen fixers. Some of them, if you have nitrogen fixers in the soil, that can help tell you, okay, so we're dealing with like nutrientless soil and there's some things going on to help remediate and regenerate the soil. Um, knowing the plant's distribution, however, for me, um, sustainability is probably one of the biggest things I like to push for as, um, to my classes to leave with, to be minded, reminded of our commitment to maintaining plant species. Um, as somebody that's worked in the food community, I've watched wild edibles become really popular. And um, how many of you are familiar with the wild leek ramps? They're also known. Delicious as martini cocktail onions, like one of the most delicious wild onions pickled as martini. Um, Tim Young from a company called Food for Thought in Lelanau County taught me about wild ramps about 12 years ago um, and also taught me how to sustainably harvest wild ramps. Um, wild ramps grow between, if, for those of you that don't know, it's an early spring onion. It's really an onion, this wild onion with this complex flavor, these leaves that are broad leaf leaves um, with this beautiful little bulb that roasted are delicious with the early asparagus, delicious in the quiche, the tops on as a garnish, wonderful, wonderful plant, really delicious. Um, the growing region grows from, in mixed hardwood forests, from about Minnesota all the way to the coast, east coast, uh, through upstate New York and across Ontario, down through, you know, down across through Vermont and up through northern Appalachia. 
and kind of back up into Michigan, um, just at the edges of the Ohio Valley. Um, the abundance of that plant is being <coughs> impacted by the foodie community's interest in wild edibles. That little bulbed onion can command $15 market rate in our farmer's markets and in our chef's kitchens. Um, communities, Ontario's put a ban on wild leaf foraging. Uh, upstate New York, they're talking also about doing something similar. It's a plant that I've watched in this community in 10 years, and I know, I, well, I know, I knew where the stands were, We've completely nearly wiped them out in this immediate area in public parks and in open spaces that I've known about them. They're nearly gone. Um, unfortunately, I've watched chefs that I, you know, have, <laughs> five years ago, if I was as passionate, you know, I'm just differently passionate, if I felt more comfortable to call out poaching, I would have called out poaching from a few chefs that I saw taking garbage bags out of a couple local parks. Um, the thing about the leek, knowing your plants and knowing how quickly they can reproduce is really a forager's obligation. That wild leek from seed, now if you all have your own favorite stands, you'll know that the plant is currently in seed. Those little seeds take three years to germinate and to produce a bulb for us to turn into martini pickles and onions and put into our quiche. And if we're taking out the entire bulb and not regenerating the stand, we're removing that plant and there will be no future harvests. Um, I say that 